We, uh, we've been talking the last few weeks about the Holy Spirit and the believer. And um, how if we are willing, the Holy Spirit that resides within us will use us. Will use us for God's glory in ways that we, uh, we often won't understand. Uh, maybe won't even want to be a part of because it's something we've never tried. And yet God is, he's unique. You know, when you look at creation and you see the uniqueness of everything that God created, it's no wonder why God wants to use us in magnificent ways. He wants to take us, his perfect creation, and use us for his glory. Today we're looking at this fourth concept of the Holy Spirit and the believer. And it's the Holy Spirit empowers us to accept others. This may be the most difficult one in these four. This may be the most difficult one to put into practice. Now, the words are easy, right? Oh, we love everybody. Trudy shared, love your neighbors yourself. Yeah, that's easy to say, isn't it? But is it always easy to do? And if you know how to do it every single day, please write a book. I will buy it. But what I do know is accepting others isn't just about accepting where they are. See, we're going to look in Acts chapter 10 today. We're going to look at the story of, of Peter dealing with an issue of not just accepting people where they are, but helping them realize where they need to be. Because ultimately, if we love people the way that we claim to love people as Christians... If we love our neighbor as ourselves, it's not about just loving them in the sin they're in. It's about helping them understand where they need to go, how they get past that sin. Who is the source of their strength? In Acts chapter 10, Peter experiences a very interesting moment. Uh, now, you need to remember that Peter was a good, faithful Jewish man living in the first century. He wasn't a scholar, but he was faithful to God. And like most of his other apostles, their understanding was that God came to reconcile them. And it's easy to see from what occurs early on in the beginning of the church, their mindset was that God came for the Jews only for the Jewish nation and those that would convert to, in essence, becoming part of that Jewish nation. So Peter's going to be asked to do something that no one before him was asked to do. Peter is going to be asked to go to the Gentiles, people like you and I, the outsiders, people who didn't grow up as part of God's favored nation. So imagine, if you would, Peter um, resisting this call. And in fairness to Peter, there are probably people in our lives, people that we've come in contact with, that you just look at and you say, well, yeah, I know they probably need Jesus, but it's a little difficult for me to go talk to them. Maybe it's nobody you've ever met, but maybe it would be some of the nations you see portrayed on television. Nations that are fully consumed by false gods. And you look and you say, yeah, I know they need it, but, well, I don't really want to be the one. Peter was asked to do something that was going to be very controversial, something that on, on some level, as we see in the book of Acts, would get him uh, in arguments and in disputes with his brothers, with the other apostles. And yet Peter, through listening to God, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, realizes the task laid before him, and he follows through. Peter had to be led by the Spirit in order to accomplish this, because it goes against everything that he had ever really learned. Everything he understood about religion was being changed. So I want to look at three different ways this morning that we can learn to accept others 
who are different than we are. And the first one is this. We need to try and see people the way that God sees them. Do you do that? When you look at somebody across the room, somebody sitting next to you, when you look at the person in the restaurant or driving in the car next to you, how do you see them? Do you see them for the mistakes they're making, for the problems they're causing, for the delay they're making you have, for the way they're acting, or do you see them the way that God sees them? Someone who needs to be loved. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that's easy, but that is what we're to do. The minute we begin to see people the way God sees them, our hearts will change. Our attitudes in reaching out will change. In Acts 10, Peter is given a vision by God. He's shown that the kingdom is available to all people. God is preparing a meeting. We talked last week about the idea that sometimes God is at work long before we realize God is at work in a story. That was what was going on with Peter here in Acts chapter 10. God is working out some details before he brings Peter in to the story. And this is what it says, beginning in chapter 10, verse 1. Now there was a certain man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household, and gave many alms to the Jewish people, and prayed to God continually. Here's the man, Cornelius. He's not a Jew, but he prayed to God. He gave alms, meaning he... He gave to the poor. He cared about the Jewish people. He cared about all kinds of people. He was a leader. Would have been a very well-respected, well-known individual. But he's not your typical Jewish man. That's the stage. That's the behind-the-scenes work that God is ready to bring Peter into the story to see what's going on. And we're going to skip down in chapter 10, and we'll come back and fill in some more of the details in a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. But we skip down to chapter 10, verse 23 through 28. Cornelius has had this idea that he needs to call for Peter. And this is what is going on. And on the following day, he entered Caesarea, and Cornelius was waiting for them. And he called together his relatives and close friends. And when it came about that Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up. I, too, am just a man. And as he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. As I said, we'll get to the the in-between part in just a moment. But we're understanding Peter's mentality. He, he follows God's leading and he goes to Cornelius' house, but he kind of does it sarcastically in the sense that, okay, I'm here, but you know I'm not supposed to be here. You're not clean. You're not holy enough for me to be associating with you. It's probably not the first good impression you want to make, is it? I don't know, in our attempt to accept others, we walk up and say, well, you know, I'll sit down and talk with you, but, you know, you're really beneath me. That's what Peter's saying. I know God sent me to you, but, you know, come on, let's be honest. We're not on the same level here, are we? Now, I don't know that any of us would ever say that, but I hope we never think it. I hope we never look around at anybody and think of them as less in God's eyes than we are. The most vile, evil person walking the earth today is still someone that God desires to have part of his kingdom. And that may be hard for us to get a hold of at times. Now Cornelius wasn't an evil man. He wasn't... a uh, um, he wasn't someone who was considered unworthy by other people. It's just Peter understood the law. I'm a good, faithful Jewish man. I shouldn't be coming into your house. But God sent me. So I'm here. 
You see, sometimes I think God is going to ask us to do things that we don't understand. He's going to put us in a place and in a situation where we, we may feel completely uncomfortable, we may not understand why we're supposed to be there or even what we're supposed to do. The question is, are we going to allow God's Spirit to put us in that place? Because if we do, fabulous things are going to happen. I don't know about you, but even on my worst days, I'm amazed at how creative and how fun God makes life. And if you don't believe that, it's because you're not trying to see that aspect of God. Peter was asked to go way beyond his thinking. When we see people the way that God sees them, our worldview will change. The second thing this morning. We need to see what happens when we get outside of our comfort zone. That's a catchphrase. Preachers have been using that phrase for decades. Get outside of your comfort zone. Some of you have a big comfort zone. Some of you have a very little comfort zone. I like to do this and this way and this way and this way. My son JW is like that. Don't change the time on anything. Don't change the direction you drive to the store. Don't change anything and he is fine. You get a little outside of what he's used to. And his mind explodes. I like to do that to him. <laughs> but you know what? I don't like people doing that to me. And they do. And they do it to you too. How are we going to respond when God is the one pushing us outside of our comfort zone? Hopefully we do what Peter did. We may not understand... I'm not even sure Peter agrees to understand or wants to understand, but he acts upon it. And I think that's our responsibility too. Okay, Lord, I don't know what's next. I don't know why you have me here. Let's have some fun. Let's do what you asked me to do. Our first response to God when he offers us an invitation however, is usually to say no. Oh, it may not be a permanent no. It might be one of these. Uh, let me stand back for a minute and see what happens, and then I'll let you know if I'm interested. No. God doesn't want that. When he says go, we go. When he says get involved, we get involved. Let's back up in chapter 10 to see what was going on with Peter on really what convinced Peter. In chapter 10, beginning in verse 9, it says this. Peter went up on the house, housetop about sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he beheld the sky opened up and a certain object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came to him. Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And again a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. And this happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Peter is given a vision that I'm not sure he fully understood at that particular moment. I don't know that he understood what it would mean to us today. But God is wanting Peter to understand something, that everything represented there on the sheet, because God put it there, was acceptable. Was okay for Peter to eat. Now this is not a home economics class. It's not about the food chart. It's not about what's good or bad to eat. But God is representing to Peter helping him understand that what God has put in place is always considered clean and perfect. You want to get into the deep theological issues of this vision that Peter sees, the four corners represents the four ends of the earth. What God is telling Peter is that everything in the world that I have put there, 
I consider clean. The animals represent you and I. Peter, no longer is it just about you. No longer is it just about your Jewish brothers and sisters. It's about the Gentiles. It's about the entire world. You want to talk about a perspective change? I think Peter probably was nervous. Have you ever had a really bright idea come to you? And uh, you, you really think it's a good idea, and it might be, but you're, you're uncertain about telling people. I come up with, in my own mind, bright ideas all the time. Some of them I share, some of them I don't. Oh, you're laughing at me, but you've done the same thing. This would be perfect if people would just understand. But we're hesitant to tell anybody, right? Imagine Peter having to go back to the apostles. Guys, listen, you're never going to believe this. Because we thought the apostles were unique individuals, right? We don't know a lot of details about them. Just a few few times when one or two of them would step up and say something or do something to give us an indication of their, their makeup. But I could see some of them going, well, now listen, no, if God wanted me to do that, he would tell me. Because sometimes we have that attitude. Oh, you can tell me to go do this, but really, if God wants me to do it, he'll tell me. Okay. Or maybe it's like this. Um, you know, you said you were hungry. Did you get some bad food? Did you really see that, Peter? See, I think all this is going through Peter's mind. He, he knows, he believes what he saw. And he's going to act upon it. But Peter's difficulty isn't just about that one particular visit that's coming up. It's about how do I tell this to everybody else? How do I convince these men? How do I convince these women that it's not just about us? And I think in the church today, sometimes we run into that same difficulty. It's not just about us. God's plan is bigger Don't take this the wrong way. God's plan is bigger than Plateau Christian Church. His plan is bigger than Crossville, Tennessee. His plan is bigger than the United States. And sometimes when we are going to accept others, it is realizing it's bigger than me. We need to remember that God is the only one who decides what is acceptable and clean. Three things happen when we get outside of our comfort zone. First is that our preconceptions are changed. Things that we thought were true may not be true. Boy, that's a difficult one to grasp. Second thing is we begin to have a burden for people who need the Lord. And the third thing is that people's lives are changed when we look beyond us. That's what Peter was being asked to do. Look beyond yourself. Look beyond the men and women who are your heritage and see what God has in store. Third thing this morning. We need to experience the validation that you're walking in the Lord's will. Sometimes that's hard, right? Am I the only one or have some of you felt like, am I really doing what God wants me to do right now? You just wander around. Sometimes I feel like life is spent like those wandering in the wilderness, waiting on that fire to move so I know where to go. And while we're doing that, while we're looking for God's will to direct us and to lead us, we're still living life, aren't we? Here's what's amazing. If you look at Scripture, when you really dig into it, the lives of all of these heroic individuals, these famous men and women 
These people we put up on pedestals that we should not put up on pedestals. When we look at their lives, what we know about all of them is a very, very short, simple amount of time. Even Jesus' ministry. We don't know very much about it. Take your favorite Bible character. How much do you really know? Maybe a week's worth of time put together in their life. What did they do the rest of the time? They just served God. They just lived life and allowed God to work through them. Sometimes as Christians, we want the bigger, uh, the best, the, the big experience, right? We want that big picture laid out in front of us because I want to do something great. No, I will tell you, if you live your life day to day just enjoying life, honoring God, you will make a bigger difference than most people who do one big thing in their life. And it will validate the fact that the Spirit is living in you. Peter begins to allow the Spirit to move in him even more. Now this is, this is the Apostle Peter. Okay? This is the one who walked on water. I don't care that he started to sink. He got out of the boat and walked on water. This is the same guy that drew his sword to defend Jesus in the garden. Why? Because he thought that's what he was supposed to do. This is the same guy that on the day of Pentecost stands up and preaches the first sermon. And he preaches about Jesus. It's the same Peter who over and over again is being led by the Spirit. And now one more time he's going to have to trust in God's leading. I don't think Peter got up that morning thinking, Let's cause trouble in the church. But that's what he was about to do. Not trouble that God would see as trouble, but that the established church saw as trouble. Look at chapter 10, beginning in verse 44. Peter is he's at the house. The house where it's, it's not cool to be. He shouldn't be there according to the law, but he's there. And this is what it says, starting in verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because of the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for those to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. God's validation to Peter of what he was asking him to do, what he was showing him in that vision, goes beyond just the fact that those who were there were able to speak in languages that weren't their own. The ultimate validation came through the fact that these individuals whom God had sent Peter to minister to, to talk to, surrendered their life to Christ, were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, that they became part of the family. It's interesting, back in Jesus' ministry, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus is talking to Peter and he talks to him about giving him the keys to the kingdom. And it's very interesting because he, the, the word key is plural when Jesus is talking to him. It's keys to the kingdom. Well, you say, what does that have to do with this? Well, Peter was the key to opening up the gospel message on the day of Pentecost. Key number one. Peter uses the key, the second key, to open up the gospel to the Gentile world. Peter didn't understand what Jesus was telling him in that day. I like to think Peter probably understood at this point. He was the one. He was the one that Jesus had determined was going to deliver the message first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Peter has opened the door to the kingdom for you and I.
Holy Spirit validates us in many ways. When we begin to accept others for who they are, for what they are, when we begin to share with them the gospel message of Jesus Christ because they need it as much as we need it, the Holy Spirit will be active. Have you ever had someone try and convert you to Christianity? After you became a Christian? It's an interesting thing. The first time it happened, I was really bothered. Because I stood there as this gentleman was talking to me, and I'm going, Buddy, don't you know I already am? And I got thinking, he didn't know. That's on me, not on him. Sometimes when we accept others, we have to know who they are. Look, look at what Peter says here in verses 34 and 35. It says, in opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not, excuse me, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. If a Jewish man like Peter could get past the heritage issue, what does it take for you and I? What does it take for us to get past seeing people the wrong way? See, there's a lot of discrimination in the world, in the country. And it's not just racial discrimination. It's economic. It's political. It's denominational. Sometimes we view people and we see their stance on things. Maybe we see a sign in their yard knowing which political party they like, and we just go, okay, I'm not talking to them. We see a bumper sticker on their car that says, my son's an honor student at such and such Catholic school, and we go, okay, well, I'm going to avoid them. And I'm not saying they all need to hear the message, but you know what? We all need to hear the message in our own life. Accepting others sometimes begins by allowing them to tell their story. See, I think the most effective thing we can do, the, the, the easiest way to reach out to someone ministering to them, helping them understand a relationship with Jesus Christ, is to tell them our story. Your individual story. What is it that brought you to a relationship with Jesus Christ? You should be very comfortable and be able to tell that. And if you're not, do this. I know I've asked you to do this before, and I would guarantee... 99.9% .9 of you probably never have done it. Because when I was asked to do it, I didn't do it either. Until I had to do it for a college class. Write your story down. Write your story down. Memorize your story if you've forgotten it. Maybe not every detail but enough that you can share what Jesus has done for you. But also be willing to listen to their story. My niece is a, a missionary in um, Thailand. I have two nieces on the mission field. One is in Thailand. And a while back, uh, she was in the States and she was... Uh, living in Kentucky with her brother and her sister-in-law and their four kids uh, for just a couple of months before she went back. And uh, my niece is a fabulous artist, um, Makes kind of makes her living on the mission field, uh, selling her artwork. She's a gifted speaker. And on Facebook one day, she put this little story I want to share with you because I think it, identified to me on what it means to begin to accept others. This is what it says. 
It says, yesterday morning, I interviewed a potential candidate for a global scope ministry via Skype. Someone I didn't know, but someone whose story I was privileged to hear. As she talked and poured out her thoughts, I couldn't help but be reminded of this need that we all have to talk about us. We should all go through the interview every now and then, just because it gives us a chance to share our stories. And we all need to share our stories. I went for a run shortly afterward, and my mind started racing with all the ideas I've been having about art, all the pieces I've been working on. A lot of them self-reflections turned into portraits, simply my way of sharing my story, my vulnerable exposure of self. I got thinking and dreaming about how to listen to people and how to get them to open up and talk about what they want to share. How can I live in such a way that people feel comfortable sharing themselves with me? What can I do to fill that need in their lives? At the end of my run, which had tapered into a walk, words started to pour through me. The words felt perfect. I played them over and over again in my head because I liked the way they fit together. And I knew I wanted to save them. Being a public speaker and a writer, I considered, or I understand the value of capturing the idea and writing it down as quick as possible because you'll never know if you remember it later. It might come out forced or unnatural, so I always try to look for the right words uh, and write them down as quickly as possible. I'm not unfamiliar with rolling out of bed in the middle of the night to jot down the inspiration or jumping out of the shower to scribble down the perfect sentiment. My keyboard is speckled with paint and my journals are smeared with sticky food stains because I'm fe I feared of losing the words in the few moments it takes to wash my hands. I never want to lose an idea or thought or phrase or, well, a story because my poor memory or lack of focus. I hasten to the house, intending to run to my room and grab my computer and start typing my thoughts out exactly as they had come to mind. Whipping open the front door, I was love-tackled by a grinning two-year-old exclaiming, Wait, Michael, as her little arms wrapped around my legs. And I couldn't leave. She gibbered and jabbered, and the words she spoke as she told her story pushed all of mine away. I didn't understand her, but that's okay. It's not about me. She wanted to tell her story. I got wrapped up in her little limbs and her little words, and before I knew it, I couldn't recall my well-crafted phrases. I lost them as quickly as they'd come. So instead of rushing to my room to write my story, I invited her in with me and let her tell hers. Because we all need to share our stories. I got thinking about that when I was working on this sermon. Sometimes in our attempt to accept others, to make a difference, to reach out, we want to jump right in and tell people they're lost. We want to jump right in and tell people you're wrong. You can't live your life that way. We want to jump right in and tell people you're a sinner. And yeah, I may be one too, but I'm forgiven and you're a bigger sinner. We want to jump right in and tell them, God doesn't want you to live your life like that. Just stop doing it. And then we get frustrated when we get doors closed in our face or when people tune us out or they don't want to have conversations. My two-year-old little second niece wanted to tell her story. It was important to her. And Michael listened. And I got thinking, how many times are we guilty of not listening to someone's story? Because it's inconvenient. It will take our time. One of the interesting studies when you start reading about communication. Most people don't listen to what you say. And the reason is, in their own mind, they're thinking about what they're going to say when you stop talking. You know it's true. We hear a phrase, we hear a word, and it triggers an idea in our mind, and we're already formulating our part of the conversation while they're still talking. 
Sometimes accepting others means we need to shut that little computer chip in our head down and just listen. I can't help you with your need unless I know your need. I can't help the person who is searching for answers unless I know what their question is. You can't help that person find Jesus Christ unless you know what it is they're really searching for and the questions they have. Accepting others isn't just about being politically correct and, oh, everything's okay. Accepting others means that we care. We care enough to listen, to be inconvenienced at times, to put our story maybe away for the moment. Now, I know I just told you, have your story. It's easy to share. Be prepared to share it. But you know, maybe sometimes the person that you need to reach the most, the person who is hurting the most, in all honesty, they may not care about your story or my story. They may not care about the fact that God really is working in our life. They want to know why he's not working in their life. And if that's the question, and I start off with all the good things God's done for me, a wall just goes right up. Accepting others means hearing their story. The Spirit will guide us and direct us to lots of unique experiences, lots of challenging times, but will never put us in a place that we cannot handle. Are you willing to listen to the stories? Are you willing to accept people where they are and help them move on? Peter did. And I don't want to hear, well, that's the Apostle Peter. He can do all kinds of things. You know what? Peter got up every morning, put his sandals on one at a time. Probably ate more than he should have at times. Probably wasn't always the most polite person in town. He's a lot like you and I. The question is, are we going to be like him in allowing the Spirit to guide us? What God considers clean and holy is always clean and holy. Let's pray. Almighty God, it is, um, it's overwhelming to think that uh, you want to use imperfect people for your perfect kingdom. And yet we see throughout time that's exactly what you've done. You will take us where we are, and you will lift us up, and you will, you will set us in a new direction. Father, in our attempt to accept others, to love people, to make a difference, many times that begins by hearing who they are, seeing their story, loving them the way you do. So, Father, I know it's difficult for us. It, it's uncomfortable at times, and it's frustrating at times. But I pray that your spirit that is living within us right now will continue to empower us to make a difference in the kingdom, to make a difference in the lives of individuals so that they will come to a saving relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.